Welcome everybody. We will get started momentarily. We are just letting the room populate. Welcome everybody. We will get started momentarily. We are still allowing people into the room. Good evening and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. In an effort to minimize distractions and to allow guests to focus on tonight's program, we've turned off guest videos and microphones. If you have a question for our speaker, please enter your question using the Q&A portion on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Since our founding in 1913, ADL has always fought anti-Semitism and the right to establish fair and just treatment for all. Anti-Semitism, as we have reported, has not stopped, nor has it slowed down. As a matter of fact, it is on the rise and has taken new forms. Tonight, we will address these new or contemporary ways anti-Semitism is showing up in our community. To get our program started, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for tonight. He is the partner and one of the top appellate lawyers in Texas at Haynes and Boone LLP, ADL Southwest Regional Board Chair, Mark Trachtenberg. Mark, welcome and thank you very much for moderating today. Thank you, Margie. Make sure my video is on here. <laughs> Um, Margie, I can't turn the video on. I don't know if you can do that on for me. I can. Here we go. Thank you. Well, everybody, uh, I also want to welcome you all to ADL's Southwest CEASE Initiative kickoff event. CEASE, C-E-A-S-E, -E, stands for Combating Extremism and Anti-Semitism Everywhere. This new initiative is focused on providing resources and information to our Jewish community about how best to address anti-Semitism. We will, we will provide more information after the program on how you can join and be involved with CEASE. Tonight for our kickoff event, we are pleased to have Dr. Gunther Ikeli with us tonight to share his research and insights into contemporary anti-Semitism. Dr. Ikeli is a historian and sociologist trained in Germany, France, and the UK, and holds the Irma, Irma B. Rosenfeld Professorship at the Institute for the Study of Contemporary Anti-Semitism, the Bourne's Jewish Study Program at Indiana University. He's an associate professor in Germanic studies and Jewish studies. From 2011 to 2012, he served as an advisor to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, on combating anti-Semitism. In 2013, he was awarded the Raoul Wallenberg Prize in Human Rights and Holocaust Studies by the International Raoul Wallenberg Foundation in Tel Aviv University. Dr. Ikeli is listed on the Al Jemeiner's list of the top 100 people positively influ influencing Jewish life in 2019. His research focuses on online and offline forms of contemporary anti-Semitism. Anti we are delighted that he's able to share some of his research findings with us tonight. Dr. Ikeli, welcome so much. Welcome, we're so glad to have you. You're on mute. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, for this uh, nice introduction. 
Uh, thank you uh, also, Margie, Lisa, Dina, and all <clears throat> who um, work uh, with the Anti-Defamation League in Southwest. Thank you, of course, for the invitation, uh, but thank you also for the work that you've been doing um, on fighting anti-Semitism. This is, I think, increasingly important by the day, I would say, um, this fight that um, you are leading and that you have now a new program. I'm delighted to, to hear that. I think we're in a moment um, in history where uh, anti-Semitism is going up again, and it will depend on people like you uh, how much damage will be done and how much we can contain anti-Semitism. I've been studying anti-Semitism for almost two decades now. Um, and what people often don't realize is how destructive anti-Semitism is uh, for Jews, of course, but also for non-Jews. Uh, so anti-Semites, uh, anti they want to destroy anything that they deem um, Jewish including the, the current social order. Let me share my screen with you. Some of it might be then easier to follow. Um, <clears throat> so is that showing up okay? Maybe not yet. <clears throat> well, I think I have to sh try again. We were practicing 10 minutes earlier, but <clears throat> I'm still having difficulty here. So I hope it's showing up okay now. Um, so <clears throat> with the, what I want to, um, say, or my point here is, if you look at anti-Semitism, it's a, it's a corruptive way of thinking. So it's more than just prejudices and stereotypes. And this is highly conspiratorial um, in, this, in this modern form that we see today. Anti-Semites, they invent or take real problems, um, but then blame Jews for, this, for these problems. Uh, depending on the political affiliation opportunity, some speak then about the Zionist occupied government and the Jewish cabal pushing immigrants to destroy the white nation. Or on the other side of the political spectrum, some speak about the Israel lobby, uh, the Mossad and Israel who's hypnotizing the world so that uh, evil can be done. <laughs> what we have seen in, in research is that anti-Semitism has, um, um, if it has become the norm, and then the emotional triggers that, um, <clears throat> that we see in images that people see on social media or in traditional media, they can then quickly lead to, um, to violent actions. And it's therefore that um, the anti-anti-Semites are so important. The um, anti-Semites we've seen are emboldened by anti-Semitic actions. And we see that in statistics about anti-Semitic incidents. We see that if there is a widely reported violent anti-Semitic crime, then we see immediately afterwards also going, um, going up the, the numbers of anti-Semitic incidents. But we also see that anti-Semites are impressionable. So they tend not to act on the beliefs if they see that there is opposition and um, if we are lucky, they might even reflect on their, on their attitudes. But at addressing anti-Semitism has to be very specific. So it's not good enough to have declaration and general statements um, that don't have consequences. It has to be specifically addressing what is anti-Semitic and there must be consequences done um, against those who, um, who have um, <coughs> done anti-Semitic actions. Um, I think that these, um, that these, um, we, we, we should be, we should assess the um, situation as we can see it today. We are in a, um, in a moment where we have uh, thriving Jewish communities, 
in this country, but also in European countries, even in Germany and in France, where people would have not thought so um, some decades ago. But this is um, this is happening, and we have laws that um, do not discriminate against um, Jews. So the um, most of the governments they are supportive of Jewish communities. Um, so the anti-Semitism comes from from other corners uh, for the moment, um, <clears throat> but we still have a growing uh, growing sense of insecurity in the Jewish communities, and Jewish communities need protection, um, as we've seen over the last decades in Europe, but increasingly so also in this country. Um, we see that in the last few decades, more and more. Jewish communities have increased their security measures, uh, certainly so after the uh, violent attacks in, uh, in, in Pittsburgh um, and then other violent um, and Semitic uh, terror attacks that I think almost all Jewish communities in this country have um, thought about their security measures and have done, were forced to do some improvements. We see uh, statistics about anti-Semitic incidents worldwide. The Cantor Center um, gives out annual reports on anti-Semitism. And I have compiled these, these numbers here. And what you see um, up to the 1990s, we had about around 200 incidents, violent incidents per year. And now we are about uh, 400, and in some years, even much higher than, than this. If we look at numbers uh, in individual countries, we see relatively high numbers in Germany and some of the crimes in the 1500s, um, since uh, early 2000s. We see in France, the most drastically, the difference between the uh, end of the 1990s and the early 2000s. <coughs> we see a significant rise in the overall number of anti-Semitic acts, but also in the violence. We see in Britain, um, a more or less steady rise of anti-Semitic incidents um, in recent years, of the last um, 25 years. You see that here. And the United States, the numbers for the United States are a little bit better, um, but you can see well, there are two, um, two institutions that collect data. There's the FBI that publish their numbers on the website every year. And then there's your organizations, the Anti-Defamation League. Um, they're doing a great job in looking at the numbers and they collect incidents. So that not necessarily hate crimes, but intimate incidents. And if you look at their numbers, it goes up uh, since 2016, significantly so. Um, and um, we don't know <clears throat> where this is going in the future, of course, but some say uh, the United States is about 15 years behind um, what has been going on in Europe. But even if we look at the FBI numbers and you see, you can say, well, it's around a thousand, maybe there's even a little trend going down the FBI numbers. But if you look at the FBI numbers in detail, then you can see that, um, Jews who are a tiny minority in this country, about 2%, um, the majority of all anti-religious anti, um, based hate crimes um, are against Jews at right? 58% in the last year. And this is, if you compare this to other groups, <clears throat> for example, Catholics who, um, who are more than 20% in this country, um, the number of anti-Catholic incidents is uh, relatively low. And if you then compare this, uh, if you put this in, in correlation uh, with the number of um, people who are <coughs> from this background, you see that um, in 2020, Jews were more likely than any other religious group or ethnic group to become victim of hate crimes. So even more so than uh, Blacks or African-Americans or Muslims or Asians, 
um, Jews were targeted uh, more often. And I don't show you these numbers to make the point that, um, that we should have a kind of hierarchy in uh, who was suffering most. I just make the point because I think this is every single hate crime um, is, is devastating for the victims and for the entire communities and has to be taken seriously. But I give you these numbers because it's often dismissed in the discourse saying that um, anti-Semitism is not really a problem uh, in this country, but it is. And if we <clears throat> look on um, data that we have on, um, on campuses, we can see that um, on campuses, Jews are particularly targeted. This is a study from a friend, um, Ayel Feinbeck. He correlated the hate crimes and the anti-Semitic bias incidents um, for campuses. And he found that Jewish students are more likely to be victims of hate crimes than any, any other minority. And um, the Jews are more likely to be the target of hate crimes on campuses um, than in other locations. So the campuses um, are apparently a specifically dangerous place um, for Jews or Jewish students. And he also found that if there are some um, organizations active that have a record of anti-Israel uh, events, such as the Students for Justice in Palestine, then it's also more likely that there are anti-Semitic incidents. Um, this is also goes for the Israel Apartheid Week. If there are activities, then um, it's more likely that there are also anti-Semitic incidents on campus. We have a number of surveys now from uh, uh, that, that have done that have asked uh, American Jewish students about the experiences of anti-Semitism, and overwhelmingly, in uh, in all of these uh, surveys, we see that um, Jewish students see anti-Semitism uh, as a problem on their own campus. Uh, this is the most recent study here <clears throat> that we've published a couple of months ago. It's that 95% um, of the respondents um, saw that as a problem. And many, the majority of them had experienced, um, so 80% here even, experienced or heard firsthand about a fellow student making offensive or threatening and some of the comments in person. And a lot of these incidents that they have been reporting on uh, reference Israel, Palestine, or BDS, or the Holocaust, swastikas, uh, Nazis, or Hitler. And this seems to be around these themes. This seems to be uh, themes that are very prominent in today's anti-Semitism. Theme, themes about Israel and themes about the commemoration of the Holocaust. Um, here's another study that comes to similar results and also shows that we are in the situation where half of the students um, hide their Jewish identity or try to hide the Jewish identity um, and also um, avoid expressing their views on Israel. And this is not only in campus. If we look at a large survey in the European Union, um, almost 40% reported of anti-Semitic harassment in the last five years and another 7% anti-Semitic violence and uh, vandalism. Um, and it's important to note that many of the victims of anti-Semitic incidents um, have not reported these incidents to any organization. Now, there's a lot, a lot of work to do that um, Jews feel comfortable in reporting um, anti-Semitic incidents and feel comfortable that something is um, done about it and followed up. And the numbers for the United States are a little bit better, um, but still, in uh, 2019, there was a survey by the American Jewish Committee, and they found that 23% um, became a target of anti-Semitic remarks in person, and another 21% became target of anti-Semitic remarks online or through uh, social media, and there were even some um, anti-Semitic uh, physical attacks. And again, it showed that the majority of these incidents do not get reported. And this leaves us 
uh, in a situation again, so not only on campuses, but um, also in general, that many Jews think that or feel uh, forced to avoid uh, wearing symbols that would uh, reveal their Jewish identity in public. Um, <clears throat> you have um, many who say they frequently avoid wearing uh, these symbols occasionally, and some even uh, all the time. In the United States, again, the numbers are better, but still 31% said in uh, 2019 that they avoiding, uh, that they have avoided publicly uh, wearing, carrying, or displaying things that might help people identify them as Jewish. So what are general trends? <clears throat> we see that there is, um, there is an increase in the anti-Semitic acts, um, or at least they're on a high level, and that violence is increasing. So more and more um, incidents we have where there is even murder, Jews are getting murdered for being Jewish. Um, we have this in extreme cases in Europe, it's mostly from jihadists and in the United States, the recent incidents have mostly been by white supremacists. Um, we see that these different attacks, so from different corners, from the extreme right, from the radical left, um, but also from the center of society, um, has led to a situation where there's an unease among, um, among uh, Jewish communities in, uh, in almost all countries, and that protective measures are increasingly necessary. So in this country, there's also increasing training uh, for, uh, for security measures. We see that certain anthemic discourses, certain narratives that were only 10 years ago on the very margins of society, they have drifted into the mainstream. And we see that uh, on, on uh, both the extreme right and the radical left, and also uh, to some extent among uh, Islamists. Um, we see that in principle still anti-Semitism is condemned, um, but often it's not followed, followed up with action. So often anti-Semites get away with the with their anti-Semitism. And a big factor, and I want to um, spend a few minutes also on that, is the online anti-Semitism, which I think is a really game-changing factor. And we, what we have to watch very closely, uh, what is going on there, and to see what can be done to diminish the, the uh, spreading of propaganda online. What we... Uh, what is uh, not yet, what has not yet happened is that, that we don't see an overarching political theme um, that um, unites anti-Semites. We see something emerging that is on anti-Zionism, where people from the radical right, from the radical left, can sometimes uh, unite. And we have seen this in... Uh, in even personal <clears throat> interactions between some uh, anti-Zionist, anti-Semites, and uh, David Duke, for example. Um, <clears throat> but I want to go briefly to these ideological sources of anti-Semitism today. So we see um, what is apparently increasingly relevant is this idea of, a, of an anti, of anti-imperialism as a worldview. Um, that is also anti-Zionism as a worldview. And there is the accusation then that Israel is the worst imperialist, racist, colonizing state. And of course, then there is the suspicion against anybody who is identified as Jews, Jewish um, that um, this person would um, <clears throat> support this allegedly evil state. Um, we see in white nationalism, there's uh, a rise of um, this idea that Jews undermine the nation, that is a very old um, idea. Um, the so-called great replacement fantasies um, are becoming prominent. Uh, you probably have all seen um, some of these slogans in Charlottesville in 2017 in this Unite the Right rally, where people shouted 
So these white nationalists shouted, Jews will not replace us. This doesn't make sense um, at all if you don't see it in this conspiracy theory, this accusation that Jews would somehow organize um, immigration and would organize this kind of replacement of white people. And then we also have um, Islamist organizations that push the narrative that um, Jews and Muslims uh, allegedly have always been enemies um, and that Jews are conspiring against Muslims and um, <clears throat> helping uh, Christian, Christian um, societies to go to war against the Muslims. What we've seen that these kind of ideologies, they were really in the margins. So this anti-imperialism, and Zionism, that was an ideology that was um, that goes back to the teachings of Mao and Shea and was Soviet propaganda in the 60s, mostly in 70s. Um, and it was on the margins, but parts of that have been taken and um, mainstreamed, if you want, so <clears throat> that um, Israel has become uh, a bad name for too many people. Um, we see that also in a reform of, of this white nationalism that <clears throat> rooted in Nazism um, and essentializing ethnicities and peoples, but there have been um, more or less successful um, ideologues who have um, reformed what was former, formerly seen as Nazism and really on the margins, and that has become now more acceptable. So <clears throat> often these, these extremes um, are given our platforms. And here there is a, a, what I think, or maybe we can, uh, uh, we can speak about this for a second. So all these anti-Semites, they can draw on a very rich um, reservoir of anti-Semitic ideas. So, and they don't go away. So what we've seen, for example, with the terrorist um, in, um, in Pittsburgh, um, who quoted in his um, in his uh, description description of his um, um, account at Gap, that's something similar to Twitter, um, a quote from John from the Gospels, um, demonizing demonizing Jews. And so these religious forms of, um, of anti-Semitism are still around and getting reformulated and are ready, ready to be taken um, by anti-Semites. So we have still this idea <coughs> that developed uh, in, the, in the first um, three centuries, maybe this um, separation between uh, Judaism and Christianity where in some polemics, at least, Jews were seen as enemies uh, or evil. Um, and um, that idea that there is this supersession um, of Christianity superseding uh, Judaism, that idea is still powerful and seems to be coming back in some Christian um, communities. And that was <clears throat> that led then historically to discrimination of Jewish communities. Then what we saw some centuries later, later there were these delusional accusations of the blood libel, so saying that Jews would uh, abduct and kill children and use their the blood for some uh, rituals. Uh, so delusional it is because there was not a single case that was uh, uh, where we could um, say that was was a case. Uh, again, also with the Black Death. Um, so making Jews responsible for uh, for a pandemic, and we see this is this has a lot of references now in the current pandemic, and historically this has led to many pogroms because if you believe these kind of things, if you believe that um, Jews would um, use the blood of Christian children for some rituals, then you believe that these are really evil people. People get emotionalized by this. Similarly, if you believe that 
uh, Jews are responsible for somehow for the pandemic, <clears throat> then this must be evil people. So this emotionalizing uh, effect of it has led often to pogroms. And we see this even today when people believe in these kind of things, they get very emotional. Um, and the uh, step to action is, is not very far. And what came up then later was the idea of race and uh, blood <clears throat> that, uh, that uh, is different from different ethnicities. And this has led to the most extreme violence uh, culminating in the, in the Holocaust, of course. And after the uh, Second World War, so after the Holocaust, a lot of this was at least uh, on the surface of it, um, was not accepted anymore in public discourse and was reformulated then. So what we see today, that uh, anti-Semitism, how that is manifested and finds some acceptance in, uh, in wider society is if it's targeting Israel, and also the memory of the Holocaust. So what I said uh, is the game changer um, is online anti-Semitism. So online anti-Semitism is a game changer because it connects anti-Semites on a level that we haven't seen before. And um, that connects these potential anti-Semites of all sorts and in all different places. And also radicalizes the anti-Semites. And what, um, we have seen not only on the issue of anti-Semitism, but in general that the uh, social media, how they work, how they operate, they promote <clears throat> divisive content. So the more divisive it is, the more controversial it is, the more this is pushed um, and the more that goes viral. So <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is a factor that really enables anti-Semites to uh, spread their ideology very widely. And there was a study about four years ago by the World Jewish Congress that showed there's an anti-Semitic message every um, 83 seconds. So we did uh, a survey only on Twitter and only on conversations about Jews and Israel. And we showed that now we have anti-Semitic remarks about every two seconds. And this is only, as I said, on Twitter and only for tweets that are still live. Um, so this is a, an acceleration of, of anti-Semitic propaganda, um, even at a time when uh, Twitter and other uh, companies are, are saying that they're gonna reduce the hateful comments <clears throat> on their platforms, there's still uh, an increase. And you can see that uh, here, for example, we saw uh, on a representative um, we did representative samples here on conversations about Jews, when 2019 we saw between six and seven um, percent of the tweets were anti-Semitic <clears throat> on conversations about Jews, and then it was only increasing in 2020. We're now looking at numbers and, uh, for 2021, and it doesn't look like this is going down. And this is <clears throat> and this is um, doesn't seem much of the in, in the percentage, but of course, if you put numbers to it, these are millions of tweet, tweets that are um, anti-Semitic. And social media, I think we, we really should pay attention because it has become, or cannot be dismissed as something that is not part of reality or that can is only virtual. Uh, social media has become part of everyday's life for most Americans. So this year, about 80% of Americans use social media and spend about an hour on average on social networks. Right. So um, we can really, we cannot dismiss uh, what's going on there. Um, there is uh, increasingly this exclusion of Jews and attacks against Jews online. Um, we have that with prominent people such as yeah, Rosenberg or Ben Shapiro. And um, recently, if Barlow, she wrote an, uh, an article, the social media program thing, she got completely excluded and other Jews as well from some conversations because of the Jewish identity. And we have this radicalizations of anti, of, of anti um who then attack online, but also offline. 
who can organize themselves, who can then go from mainstream platforms such as Twitter to more radical platforms such as <clears throat> Gap or 4chan or others, um, and who can then spread the anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy worldviews um, that are also a threat to democracy. Um, we had uh, this promise after the Second World War of never again. Um, and that was a promise also to do better, to protect minorities, including Jews, of course. And this, these developments of a rise of anti-Semitism again is also um, a moral bankruptcy of, these, of the democracies if we cannot uh, stop that. So um, this, I think, is in the interest of, of everyone who uh, cherishes democracy to do whatever they can um, to become part of the anti-anti-Semites. So if we ask questions, why is this development now? I think what is always very important to emphasize that Jews have never been the source of anti-Semitism. Uh, so the wish to exclude and murder Jews has everything to do with the anti-Semites and nothing to do with, with Jews. It's in the fantasy of the anti-Semites, <clears throat> their image of Jews that they hate. And then they, of course, attack real Jews. And anti-Semitism has been gone through, um, through different waves um, and different stages in history but it has always been strong in times of purifications. And uh, what we see on social media, this facilitates and accelerates these purifications on <clears throat> um, whatever the, uh, the political affiliation is. And that it comes up as a sign of this uh, ideologization, um, the radicalization, intolerance and political instability. We had a webinar yesterday here at um, our institute where um, Professor Waller came and um, talked about the threat of mass violence. And what he, one of the factors that he found is that if other people, uh, of people see certain um, opponents as an existent existential threat, <clears throat> then the step to violence uh, is very close. And if that is then loaded with some anti-Semitic ideas, this um, becomes really dangerous. Um, <clears throat> it also, uh, this kind of anti-Semitic um, ideology hurts, moderates, and um, can become really immensely destructive because of this irrationality and this uh, conspiratorial core. So anti-Semitism is this conspiracy mindset where you don't address uh, problems, you just blame problems uh, on Jews. So what anti-anti-Semites um, I think increasingly realize, and th there's some hope there, um, that there is this damaging impact of anti-Semitism also for their own communities. So we see that Muslims uh, <clears throat> oppose Islamism. I was recently uh, approached by um, a think tank from the Emirates, uh, and they want to learn how <clears throat> people have spoken out against anti-Semitism in Europe, uh, to learn how, um, how Muslims can speak out against Islamism in, in their countries. Um, I see at least uh, in some parts, conservatives opposing uh, white supremacism, liberals and progressives opposing anti-imperialism and this binary worldviews. But it's difficult in the current situation to speak up um, against that <clears throat> for a number of reasons. So what I see in even my own experience here on, um, on campus in Bloomington, where relatively few anti-Semitic incidents have been uh, reported over the, over the last years. And I've been here for six years now. Um, yesterday, um, uh, a very talented student 
uh, Noah Kaufman sent me a survey that he did um, from, uh, from students here, more than 50 students, where they had reports, the majority of the students here at Indiana University uh, said they had experienced um, some forms of anti-Semitism and half of them on, on campus. Um, so even in these, um, in these, on these campuses that are relatively quiet, the uh, Jewish students face more and more anti-Semitism. And this has to be taken seriously by the administrators. Uh, we have spoken to administrators that, <clears throat> that are relatively, um, they want to be helpful, but they are not aware of the, um, the threats that, or the experiences that uh, Jewish students face. So there's a lot of work to do um, to, um, to address this, to raise awareness. Mm -hmm. So I think that, again, that the work that you're doing at ADL is immensely important. And I'm more than happy to see and discuss what you can, what you are doing, what you can do, and what maybe we can do together to address these problems. Thank you so much for your for your attention, and I think we should go into the discussion as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you for that really fantastic presentation. That was extraordinarily informative. Uh, we do have some questions uh, from the audience that I'd like to post to you. Um, and let me start by with this question. If you could, if you had access to the policymakers in Washington, DC, or London or Brussels, any, any Western democracy, what would you tell them to do to, to help thwart this, this rise in, of, of anti-Semitism? What, what can we do to help protect Jewish communities and push back on, on these kind of very dangerous trends? Right. I think one of the, the first things is that, that you acknowledge that there is a problem. And I think this has been happening more and more, but still not enough. So it has been on the highest levels in, in most European countries. Uh, there is an acknowledgement. There has recently been, even in the Council of Europe, um, uh, a declaration that everything should be done to fight anti-Semitism. But how does it translate then into practice and in the individual countries and then regionally as well? So uh, now there are only three, four countries that collect data on anti-Semitic incidents in Europe. Uh, in the United States, there is a long tradition, but I think also thanks to the Anti-Defamation League, there's a very strong organization that has been in this business of, of looking at anti-Semitic incidents for many, many decades. So this is lacking in, in many European countries, of course. We don't have these strong Jewish organizations that, that um, can then push for that and, and demand that this is done. So this is the first thing that they really look into, okay, what is happening and track the data um, and then address us as well, address it in all dimensions. So there are a number of things <clears throat> that are difficult to address. The easiest thing in most countries is to address anti-Semitism that comes from the margins, very much margins, um, wherever they are, uh, usually from the far right. There are still in all these countries pockets of the far right, um, Nazi admirers, if you want. Um, uh, they, uh, some of them are really uh, radical and a threat, a terror threat, um, and it's, in the public sphere, easy to address that and condemn it. It's more difficult if it's um, if it's more hidden. So if you address it, if it's voiced in the form of um, of demonizing Israel, then it's much easier to get away with that. And that also needs to be addressed. And it's to be clear, of course, not everything, uh, every criticism. Criticism is never um, biased, but if you, and that's, I think that's why you're, you're, the name of your organization is so good. If you defame somebody or community or country, that's defamation, that's bias. If you criticize, that's a completely different story. So you don't, and what's going on is a lot of defamation um, of the Jewish state. And then by that, um, Jews, do not feel safe to 
to identify themselves as Jews. I had colleagues in Paris when I was working in Paris, they would not tell anybody um, of their colleagues that they would travel to Israel to visit their relatives there because they were fearing the hostile questions they would receive if they would tell them. Very good. What we had, we've had a series of questions about uh, the role of social media and the rise of anti-Semitism and, and, and the correlation. But what, one question is, is, it, is social media, is it the same percentage of people that have anti-Semitic uh, attitudes and social media just allows them to, to reach farther and connect more and we hear their voices more than we did or is it, or is the social media allowing um, that those that percentage to, to expand to act on uh, to expand those attitudes and act on them and i guess a related question is uh, a lot of these social media companies claim to be have have plans in place or programs in place to monitor and eliminate or uh, hate, hate speech on their platforms and i don't know if you've had any thoughts about whether those have been effective whether there have been any improvements at all in that regard mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's that people have anti-Semitic ideas is not new. Um, most people, I mean, I did hundreds of interviews with people who have anti-Semitic ideas and spoke to them. And what I noticed is that only very few are 100% sure about their own attitudes, right? They voice offensive things, statements about Jews that I would say are anti-Semitic, but they are not 100% sure of that. So <clears throat> what happens without social media is sometimes they tell their friends maybe or their relatives and then that's it. And sometimes they get, they get reinforced and sometimes not, but it stays in smaller circles. If they do that on social media and if they do it at a time when there are trigger moments like in this year's May, when a lot of people uh, felt very emotional about the conflict between Israel and Hamas. And a lot of people were siding with Hamas. And that gave a lot of room for people to voice their anti-Semitic ideas, projecting it on this conflict. So that means then this, this can just go viral. Things that would have been without social media being just kept more or less in the private smaller circles. And now it goes viral and people get con this confirmed. And then they don't meet any opposition or it's very difficult. What we saw also in May, those who would have voiced maybe op opposition before of these views, they were just silent because they could not face all this backlash when you have this moment. So this is something, these dynamics, these dynamics, they change. This is why I said it's a game changer. So what social media companies are doing there was an interesting article in the, in the Wall Street Journal on this weekend about Facebook, how they try to, um, to dampen some of the movements that can become uh, violent even. There was this example of the um, Patriot uh, Party. Um, and they're doing something sometimes, but very ad hoc. So their algorithms are programmed in a way that they even promote these radical, radicalized ideas. So the current system, the default system of these <laughs> Twitter and Facebook and all the social media companies is if something is divisive, that's good. They're gonna push it with the algorithms because they want more traffic. So they don't have the mechanisms yet and it's also against their economic interests to reduce that. They want to keep people engaged. So they have to find different models. So maybe we have to help them find different economic models <laughs> that they don't make their business model on, um, on emphasizing these kind of divisive discourses. And anti-Semitism is only one of them. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the whether the IHRA definition uh, of anti-Semitism is useful 
for this discussion and combating anti-Semitism. And, and, and you might just explain roughly what that, for people that don't know what that definition is, what that what that's referring to. Yeah, that's, it has a long history. It's an interesting history. So in um, uh, 2001, there was a, a United Nations conference on racism in Durban. And at this conference that um, a lot of NGOs also participated in this conference, and what it became became a hate fest against Israel and also very openly anti-Semitic. So in this setting, a lot of um, Jewish communities, but also some governments said, we need to do something about this and recognize um, this forms, these new forms of anti-Semitism. And also we saw what I showed these numbers in the early 2000s, there was a rise of anti-Semitic incidents in Europe and a lot of these anti-Semitic attacks were related to Israel in some way. So Jewish communities in Paris got attacked and the perpetrator said, we just want to protest against Israel, but then they were attacking the, the uh, synagogue in, uh, in Paris or in Berlin, right. or attacking Jews on the streets. So we needed a definition then that has some, that takes into account that this can, uh, how that can be voiced, this can also be Israel related. So on how this definition is structured, what is now known as the ARA definition, that's also the definition that the State Department uses, by the way. Um, it has a relatively broad sentence of definition, what antisemitism could be. And then it has examples, 11 examples. And uh, many of them are giving examples that relate to, um, to Israel. So something like if you, if you um, uh, say that the, um, <clears throat> the policies of the, of the Israel government are like the Nazis, um, then this is a good sign that this is an anti-Semitic uh, statement. So I think it's very helpful, this our definition, because it makes you look at these examples and saying, well, if somebody says something along these lines, you should have a closer look and see if that's anti-Semitic or not. And that's how this is formulated as well. It says explicitly, criticism of Israel is not anti-Semitic. We have to take every statement in the context, but then give the examples. Um, and these examples are very helpful because as I said, we need something that uh, points out also the modern manifestations of anti-Semitism and not only the uh, old ones or certain ones. We have a question about whether the, the role of Muslim immigration uh, in Western Europe, um, Germany, France, Sweden, and whether the role that may play in, in anti-Semitism in, in, in that area. Sure, so in, uh, in Europe, it depends on the country. Um, we have surveys from um, uh, this, this one big survey that I, um, that I quoted <clears throat> from the European Union. They also asked the victims of anti-Semitic attacks who, the, who they think the perpetrators are. And from there we have in countries like France and <clears throat> also Germany, the majority of the victims of anti-Semitic attacks said that Muslims uh, were the perpetrators. Um, then there was also a big category of um, people from the political left and the political right. And in some countries like Hungary and Poland from, um, from Christian nationalists, um, but yes, of course, the um, um, parts of the Muslim population, um, they have been, uh, has been seen that there are, um, there are anti-Semitic perpetrators and also the, uh, all the anti-Semitic murders. So when Jews were murdered for being Jewish in Europe, all of the perpetrators made some reference to jihadist ideology. And kind of a related question, and we had another question about the kind of the, the, in terms of we talked about incidents, but I think the focus of the question was on violent incidents uh, against Jews in Europe and the trend there. And I don't know uh, if, if possible, but the, the question was whether you foresee that trend 
worsening uh, in, in the United States in terms of in terms of violent incidents. Yeah, so I look at indicators, and so indicators of what could um, reduce anti-Semitism and what could enhance anti-Semitism. And if I look at some of these factors, if I see like the um, the diverse, the, the divisive discussions that we have on a number of issues, if I see that debates on anti-Semitism are becoming more and more partisan, um, then I, but I also see organizations like your organization uh, coming up with more and more programs and taking this more and more seriously. But overall, the factors that would point us to think that there still will be an increase are stronger than those who would say this is going to go down. But who knows? I mean, we, not, we cannot look into the future, but the factors, the trends, they do not point in the right direction yet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank the audience for those, those questions. We do have one last question before we wrap up. Uh, and that's where do we go from here? What is, what is the one takeaway uh, you'd like to share with us tonight? What, what should we all take home from this, this presentation? All right. So what I, what I really see, one of the biggest problems uh, is that this has become a partisan issue that, um, um, that people <clears throat> only think one dimensional of one group of perpetrators. Anti-Semitism is so broad it has something in for everyone. And so that can be from the political left or political right or some other affiliation. And if we want to do something political about it and it has to be political, I think, then we should think about this as a bipartisan project. Uh, we cannot win this if we only go with one political party or direction or so this, this would not work. So I think, I hope that this is that more and more people, not only in both parties, because I think it's more important people on the, on the ground, what they do um, in, their, in their counties, how they approach that. We have, I'm lucky that we have uh, here in this Bloomington, um, little Bloomington, we have a group that is a bipartisan group, um, that has both Democrats and conservatives and people with no affiliation who have been working on a website uh, on seeing how to fight uh, white nationalism um, because there were some incidents here around town. Um, and these kind of initiatives, I think this is this important that people come together and then see also look at what's happening. And on this white nationalism, I think this is um, also something that people don't realize. Uh, Eric Ward has um, put this nicely. The essence of this white nationalist idea is anti-Semitic because the, somehow they go against the achievements of the civil rights and the way they explain how a group of people that is not white and in their eyes is not is not as strong as intelligent as white people has now the same rights how can that be it can only be because jews are somehow conspiring uh, against them and organizing that so that's deeply deeply anti-semitic but we also see that on the left so <clears throat> yeah as i said we have to <laughs> come together to realize that that is a great closing message and one we should all take to heart uh, unfortunately, we're out of time and we're not able to respond to the other questions, but I want to thank you all for attending this program and thank you, Dr. Waikoe, uh, Waiko for your presentation. Uh, this program is made possible through the generosity of the Edith and Sydney Goldens, uh, Goldenson Fund and the ADL's Fund for the Future Southwest Region. We'll be sending a follow-up email with a link to tonight's recorded program, as well as a list of additional information uh, and resources on ways to help combat anti-Semitism. Uh, if you haven't already registered for this year's Never Is Now conference, we'll also provide a link, including uh, for that, uh, and, as well as information on COE credit. Thank you again, and have a great night.